Again, Celtic, God bless you. I love you, men of God. I really do. You and your wife, your lovely wife, Jocelyn, y'all so faithful. Many of you don't know that couple, but that couple serves in the church. They actually help clean up the church. I came in yesterday, and the man of God had a micro, had a, had a, uh, a vacuum in his hand, and I know he probably had a plunger in his hand and a mop in his hand, and as he was cleaning the church, and he was just doing it unto the Lord, not unto man, and just honoring the Lord. And, and just what I've learned is that I never want to give people a microphone that ain't willing to pick up a toilet plunger. Amen. God is attracted to humility. Hallelujah. I'd rather be a doorkeeper at the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Whose birthday? Jalen's birthday. Oh. Okay. And Mama's birthday in the back. Hey, Mama. How old? Wow. 75. Amen. We have them from seven months all the way to 75 years old in the church. Praise the Lord. Now that's diversity. That's kingdom. That is kingdom. So good to see you in the house. I'm going to dive into my assignment. No further delay. Yeah, there's a Valentine's dance too. That will be coming up. Make sure you see Michael and Miss Shawnee for the details of that. If you're interested in participating in that. Miss Shawnee and Michael to be putting that on soon. And also to Priscilla Shire Conference, which will be uh, coming up. But just see Miss Fanny today. This is the last day to pay today if you want the discount fee. So make sure you see her. Glory. Glory. Now, now look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, just talk to him. Be serious with him. Say, now you didn't took all pastor's time up. <laughs> Jumping up and down for Jesus. But just give him a little bit more time. Because he's got to get that word out. Amen. My water's done broke and the baby's on the way. 1 Samuel chapter 30. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Y'all have it? It says, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag. Somebody say Ziklag. They attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no power to weep. They cried until they couldn't cry anymore. I don't know if anybody's been there before. And David's two wives, Ahinoam, Jezreitus and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, have been taken captive. Now this is the Old Testament now, so no men don't get no ideas about that. <laughs> Verse 6. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, and every man for his sons and his daughters. But David. Somebody say, but David. David. Strengthen himself and the Lord his God. Another translation say he encouraged himself in the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Amalek's son, bring forth the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So when David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall overtake them, and without fail recover what? Oh. Does it say some in your Bible? What does it say? What does all mean in Hebrew? Ah, oh, scholars. Verse 9. So David went. I want to stop right there. Father, help me to convey your word in a way that glorifies you. Lord, I know, God, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any living creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We're sealed with the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. God, you have loved us with an everlasting love. You have engraved us in the palm of your hand. Speak to us. Speak to us, God. And we just praise you forever for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated in the house. I love when the prophet Samuel goes into the room to anoint the next king of Israel. How many of you read about that? Amen. So what he does is the prophet Samuel, as he goes into the room, he is given the word from the Lord because King Saul has been rejected in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 
The Bible says that the kingdom was rent or ripped from the hand of King Saul. And the Bible says that it was given to another that was better than him. In other words, because King Saul rebelled against the Lord and he rebelled against the counsel of the prophet Samuel, which came directly from the Lord, as a result, he had lost the kingdom. But God looks at him and says that, tells King Saul, I have rent the kingdom from your hands, I have stripped it from your hands, and I have given it to another that's better than you. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, it says obedience is better than sacrifice. So the prophet Samuel, he's mourning. What he does is he cries out to God. And as he's praying, God literally tells the prophet Samuel to get off your face. He said, I have rejected King Saul and I have chosen another. I want you to rise and go to the house of Jesse for I have found the next person who's going to be the king of Israel. He leaves the place and he goes to Jesse's house. And when he enters the threshold, he tells, he tells Jesse, he says, one of, the, one of your sons has been called by God to be the next king of Israel. The Bible says that Jesse, he rallies his sons together. He puts seven in front, front of uh, prophet Samuel. And Samuel, he takes the oil and he begins to anoint the first one, which comes through the door. And now, this is Eliab, who is a striking, handsome guy, who is uh, broad shoulders, tall, very handsome guy. And as he steps up, and Samuel looks at him, and he says, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. And he takes the oil, and he's about to anoint Eliab. The Bible says that the oil doesn't flow. Hallelujah. The oil doesn't flow because the oil is for somebody else. Aren't you glad that your oil is for you? Hallelujah. Uh, I ain't got to worry about nobody taking my oil. Hallelujah. That oil is for me. Somebody shout glory. Then Shammah comes in and the Bible says that God has a, God examined every one of those people. And he said that I've examined those and I've rejected those because their heart is not right before me. The Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. I'm so glad that God looks at the heart. But the Bible says that as he goes to anoint, he can't anoint any of them because the oil is for none of the seven. So he asked Jesse, he said, do you have another son? Because I know I heard the voice of the Lord telling me that the, son, that the next king is going to come out of your household. And he says, I have a son, his name is David. But surely David can't be king. He has to be, the, he, he's out there in the sheepfold. And that was what the girls did back then and the ladies did. They handled the sheep. But David was out there handling the sheep. More than likely he was a misfit. More than likely he was a black sheep. More than likely he wasn't considered part of the, even the household. But I love that sometimes when people count you out, God will count you in. I love that I was an outcast with man so I could be an incast with God. Somebody shout glory. So, they, so Samuel says, I'm not leaving until you bring him into the house. And so the Bible says that Jesse goes and fetches uh, David. And David comes into the threshold. When he does, he sees David and the Lord speaks to Samuel and he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before you. And he takes the oil and he begins to pour it upon David's head. Now, David is a, a young child at the time. And the Bible says he's a ruddy, a ruddy little child of good countenance. But he anoints him that day with the oil. And from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon David. It's powerful because he's sent on an assignment to go help his brothers. And he takes bread and cheese. And as he goes out, he goes to the Valley of Elah. And on one side, they have the Philistines. On the other side, they have Israel. And in the middle, they have a giant whose name is Goliath. He's nine foot, nine inches. And then while he is there, he has an individual in front of him carrying his shield. And he's carrying his sword. And he is this, this person who has all this armor on. But when David gets there, he asks, the brother, asks his brother, brothers, what's going on? And they said that there's a giant that's in the middle of this valley. And what he's doing is he's defying the armies of the living God. So what David does is he says, how dare this, how dare this individual, this uncircumcised Philistine, defy the armies of the living God? In other words, David is saying, here I am, an individual with a covenant with Almighty God. How dare somebody outside of covenant say anything about my God and my Savior? So the Bible says that King Saul tells him, he said, look, you can't go up against this guy because you're just but a little child. And then David says something so profound. He says, look, King Saul, he said, when I was a little boy and the, the lion came and they took my sheep, he says, I went out and I went and got the sheep back from the lion. I grabbed him by the beard and I smoked the lion and I brought the sheep back. And he said, when the bear came and took the sheep, he said, I went out and I got the bear and I held the bear down and I took the sheep back. And he said, the same God that delivered me from the hand of the bear and the hand of the lion is the same God that's going to deliver me from the hand of this wicked uncircumcised Philistine. So King Saul of course tries to put the armor on David and David said I haven't tried these. I have to go with my own armor. How many of you know you got to use your own stuff? I love T.D. Jakes but I've got to use my own stuff. There's many men of God I admire but I've got to wear my own armor. Hallelujah. 
I can't wear their armor. So what David does is he takes his stone and he takes his sling. He takes five smooth stones and he goes out to the field, the valley of the Ella. And the Bible says that King, uh, that, that the Goliath looked at David and he said, you sent this little boy out to fight I'm a man? He says, you come to me with sticks and stones. He, and, and David says, you come to me, though, in the name, you come to me with sword and shield. And he said, but I come to you in the name of the Almighty God. And the Bible says he takes the stone and he slings it and it goes between Goliath's eyes. It sinks into his forehead and Goliath comes down. Aren't you glad that giants do fall? And he runs up and he jumps on top of Goliath's chest. He unsheaths Goliath's sword. He decapitates Goliath. And then the joker walks around with that big old horse head everywhere he goes. I want somebody to know that if God be for you, who can be against you? And the Bible says that from that point forward when he went to Israel, the women in the whole Israel, they were saying, Saul has killed his thousands and David had killed his ten thousands. And the Bible says that King Saul eyed David from that point forward and he took javelins and he threw it at David. David and he tried to kill David. He told David, he said, go out and bring me a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And David went out and he brought 200 foreskins of the Philistines and he threw it at the feet of King Saul. In other words, what I want you to know is that David was a warrior. David was bad to the bone. They said that it was better for them to lose 10,000 men than it would be for them to lose David. David was a man's man. David did not play any games. In fact, if you read the Psalms, he prayed imprecatory prayers, which means basically he was he was, he, was, he was hardcore in his prayers. In fact, in one of his prayers, he said, I would love to bathe my feet in the blood of the wicked. David looked at his hands and said, you teach my hands to war. He was somebody who was bad. You wouldn't want to mess with David. In fact, when Abigail and Nabal were there, he said, I'm going back and killing Nabal and I'm killing everything. I'm going to give you King James Version. I'm not, I'm not cussing. But this is what he said. He said, I'm going to kill everything that pisses against the wall. That's what he said. That's the Bible. The Bible says that. In other words, he was a bad man. He, he didn't play no games. You didn't want now, I'm not quoting the Bible now. Go back and look at King James Version. That's what it says. It is, I'm, I'm cleaning it up. I'm telling you, I ain't cussing. That's, that's right there in the Bible. That's what he said, though. He was a bad man. You didn't want to mess with David. David was bad to the bone. He was let down through a window. But it was King Saul wanted to kill him. And everywhere he would go, he was hiding from King Saul. And he ended up in the cave, cave which was at Adullam, the place called Adullam. And while he was there, it was 450 men that had joined themselves to David. They were in debt. They were discouraged. They were discontented. But if you hang around a man of God long enough, something on him is going to get on you. And the Bible says that mighty men were raised up from these guys. So in chapter 29, they're 75 miles away from Ziglag. And so here these men are. They've been out doing the work of the Lord. They've been praying. They've been serving. They've been, they've been conquering the enemy. 75 miles away. And they travel all this way. Now you have to think. They didn't have Cadillacs back then. They didn't have the Greyhound bus. They didn't have, uh, they, they didn't have American Airlines or none of that. So they were on feet or they were on camels or they were on horse. But 75 miles, they come back home. And listen, when they come back home, they come back to the place called Ziglag. And when they get there, they see in the distance, they see a smoke, a, cl a cloud of smoke coming up from the village. When they get there, they're thinking in their heart that their wives are going to be running out of the running out the houses to greet them with open arms and their kids are going to be running out the houses to say daddy is home but when they get there all they see is fire all they see is devastation all they see is destruction all they see all they have is heartache and pain and great losses and they look around for their kids and they're nowhere to be found and they look around for their wives and they're nowhere to be found and they look around for their stuff and it's nowhere to be found and the men the bible says are in great distress they're in mourning they're in agony and they begin to cry and they begin to weep and the bible says that they weep and they cry to the lord until they cannot cry anymore they're in a place where they believe that they've been defeated they're in a place where they feel like they've lost everything they're in a place where they're so low where they have to look up and to see bottom they're in a place where there's agony and there's frustration and there's doubt and there's fear here they are in this place and the bible says that they begin to pick up stones and they begin to look at david now i want you to know church that Ziglag is a place that anybody who desires to be great has to go. Ziglag is the place that God will put in the path of destiny, in the path of greatness. See, because listen, church, crowns don't make kings. It is Ziglag that makes kings. In other words, what I want you to understand, it is impossible for you to stand in Zion unless you have sat 
in zigzag. It is impossible. See, because the oil itself would initiate David, but it would zig, it would be zigzag that would graduate David. The Bible clearly says that while they were in this place, they lifted up stones to stone David. And I love what David does. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't go and get another entourage. He doesn't go and get an assembly of other people to follow him. But what he does is he encourages himself in the Lord. He encourages himself in the Lord. One thing in order for you to be great church, you have to understand that you have to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. If you live long enough, you'll find out that your pastor can't always encourage you. That mama can't always encourage you. That your wife, Mary folk, can't always encourage you. Come on somebody, any Mary folk in here can testify that your husband can't always encourage you. And there comes a time in your walk and journey with the Lord that you have to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. There comes a time where you can't depend upon service to service for you to get your encouragement. If you depend on encouragement from Sunday to Wednesday and then from Wednesday from Sunday, then what you are doing is you're living on a church high and you are not living on a full victory. You might have been an alcoholic, but now you're a churchaholic and God wants you to know how to encourage yourself in Him because there's going to be a times in your life where things are going to hit you where folk can't lay hand on, hands on you and they get fixed. There are going to be things that come in your life where no matter what you do as far as asking other people, they're not going to be able to help you. You're going to have to get to the place in your walk in relationship with the Lord where you say, God, it's just me and you. I need you. I'm going to encourage myself in you. Come on, give God a praise in this place. See, David had learned to encourage himself before. This is why he said, he said, he says, be not disquieted, O my soul, O that which was in me. He says, hope thou in the Lord. Why are you downcast? He learned to minister to himself. I've learned before you can preach to others. You've got to learn to preach to yourself. I've learned before you can speak life over other folk. You've got to learn to speak life over yourself. There comes times in your life where you've got to grab your head and say, head, you ain't going to do that no more. I prophesy. Rapasada. I say, I prophesy over you right now. You have, you are not given the spirit of fear, but a power and a love and a sound mind. I can't get no help up in here. I just wish somebody would learn to encourage themselves in the Lord. And so what he would do then, church, I believe he began to play back in the Rolodex of his mind all the things that God had done for him. So while everybody was looking at the smoke and everybody was looking at the loss and everybody was looking at the devastation, David had gotten to the place with the Lord where he realized that before he had a wife, he had God. That before he had kids, he had God. That before he had an army, he had God. That before he had stuff, he had God. And he began to remind himself about the God he had when he was on the backside of the, of the, on a sheepfold there messing with sheep. In other words, raising these sheep up. He remembered in his heart those days when he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He remembered in those days where he said, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? He remembered in those days when my father, Jesse, and my mother forsake me, even the Lord shall take me up. He had something on the inside of him to draw from. Is there anybody in here that has something on the inside of them to draw from in the time of trouble? See, if you, if you got to dig a well when trouble hits, you too late. You got to have a well on the inside of you. Because this, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's your time to praise the Lord in this place. So he began to replay in his mind. He began to replay when he was standing in the living room in front of his brothers. Where Samuel anointed him with that oil. No wonder he said, thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh, I don't know who can get that. God will bless you in front of the people that hate you the most. Ah! Oh, I wish, oh my goodness, I wish somebody would get that. He'll bless you. He'll bless you right in front of them. So he remembered the oil on his head. He remembered standing in that living room. He remembered 
when he when that giant fell he remembered he had snapshots in the spirit where he was able to stand on Goliath's chest he had snapshots in the spirit where he walked around with Goliath's head he remembers in his spirit that he was able to get 204 skins of the Philistines he remembered in the spirit not by might nor by power but by the spirit he remembered in the spirit that when Saul would take javelins and throw it at him he was like the matrix dodging every single javelin he understood who God was and he understood that the same God that delivered him from the lion and from the bear was going to be the same God that delivered him from Ziglag in other words he encouraged himself in the Lord he encouraged himself in the Lord when they took the camera and they took that, yeah, of course, there was disappointment there. I rode around for an hour and a half to find the person to pray with them. That took the cameras. I couldn't find them. If I found them, I would have prayed with them. I rode around for about an hour and a half. It was about, about, about 2 o'clock before I got home. It was late. My daughter was with me. She said, what you going to do when you find them? I said, we're going to have an altar call. Give myself away. So you. But I began to think in my mind how when we started this church, we didn't have but a little bit of tools. And, and, and one day we came to work, we was, we was busting knuckles and we were bleeding and all kind of stuff. And, and, it, and we, we came back to this church and all of our stuff had been stolen. All of our tools had been stolen. Everything had been gone. And, and I remember the men being discouraged. And, and while they were being discouraged, I, I told them, I said, hope thou in God. And we began to pray and we began to praise the Lord. And listen, I kid you not, that same week, a man pulled up in a red truck. And he got out the truck and began to unload his truck with tools. And he looked me in the eyes. I never saw that man before. He looked me in the eyes and he said, the devil can't stop God's work. He unloaded that truck and he left. I never saw him since. But the same God that provided then is the same God that's going to provide now. So he encouraged himself. I got a lot more. I got a lot more. I got a lot more. So he encouraged himself in the Lord. Begin to replay those things in his mind. When you're discouraged, begin to replay those things in your mind. And I believe that as he was there, maybe he was on his knees or maybe he was on his face before God. But I believe there was something on the inside of him that began to tell him to look at his hands. Because he said, God, you teach it my hands to war. And he, and he began to think about his mouth. And he began to think of where he wrote that everything that had breath, pra pra praise the Lord. And he began to think that, that everything, he said, I will bless the Lord at all times. In other words, even in this time, I will bless the Lord. In other words, the word was so much in him. That word I have hid in my heart. It was so much in him that when life hit him like that, he was able to encourage himself because he had so much word in him. In other words, he was able to speak that life over his own self and begin to pull himself out of that mess. And not only that, he said, as long as I have, I believe that he said this, as long as I have hands, I can fight. As long as I have a mouth, I can give God praise. As long as I have breath, I can worship. As long as I have feet, I can give God a dance. As long as I have this, I am better off to the, you got what I'm saying? I want somebody not to look on what you you've lost but look at what you have because when you begin to do that that's a way to encourage yourself in the Lord do you know there's a multi-millionaire people in the community that would love to buy the amount of life that you have left they would give every single penny they have just to have the years that you have left on your life just to have one year that you have left on your life and you taking it for granted you, you, you being discouraged you need to lift your eyes to the hills from whence come at your help you need to realize that God will give you a garment of praise in exchange for a cloak of heaviness you know that God will give you beauty for ashes and the Bible says he began to encourage himself in the Lord and he said Lord he, he told his men he said go give me an ephod listen the ephod is the priestly this is the part that we miss see David just didn't get up and go fight like most of us would do in our flesh. David just didn't start sending text messages and doing all that stuff that we would typically do. No, he got into the presence of God and with that ephod. See, this is what the Lord showed me even during worship. Get this, my 
God, this is good. Ziklag, Ziklag is the place where they make kings, but they don't only make kings in Ziklag because David was a king the second the oil hit his head in God's eyes, but David had never stepped into really that priestly role. But when tragedy hit and when calamity hit, then what David did is he had to step out from the king role and step into the priest role. I know that I'm a king in Christ, but the Bible says that he has made us kings and priests unto our gods. I'm not a filthy, low-down sinner saved by grace. I am a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I am chosen. I am elected. I am beloved. I am accepted. Away with that dead religiosity, trying to sound holy mumbo jumbo that ain't scripture. I am a king and I am a priest. But David stepped away from the kingly anointing and he stepped into the priestly. In other words, he understood. Now I'm representing God to the people and I'm representing the people to the God. To God. In other words, even though, even if they acting crazy, I've got to stay in my lane. Even even if they're acting loony, I've got to stay focused on God. Even if, come on somebody, I want somebody to understand that sometimes you've got to step away from the kingly and put on the priestly. As he put on that ephod, he began to get instructions. There's something happens powerfully when you get into God's presence and you put on that ephod. He begins to download stuff into your spirit. He begins to say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has he entered the hearts of men, the things that I have prepared for those that love me. But God has revealed those things to me by his spirit. He begin to say to you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, ye may be also. He'll begin to say, call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you know it's not. He'll begin to say, I will cause all things to work together for your good. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. I am the God that sent ravens to feed Elijah and I'm the same same God that will supply your needs. Somebody needs to give God a praise in this place. And he stepped out in faith after he heard from heaven. And the Bible said that he went to pursue. And as he began to pursue, the Bible says that he recovered all. And not only that, the spoils were so great that it took days to gather them up. There's something happens in Ziklag. See, Ziklag was just a divine setup. Ziklag was a place of testimony. See, they just took our cameras. That ain't gonna hurt this church at all. I'm telling you, God is faithful. I'm telling you, if I come and pull up in the parking lot and the church is burned down, then what I'm gonna do is grab a brick and another brick because the devil cannot stop God's work. I wish somebody will give a God a praise in this place. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. But some of you, you got to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. You waiting on mama. You waiting on daddy. You waiting on your wife. You waiting on your husband. And as long as you waiting on other people to fix you, you'll always stay broken. Listen, if you're waiting on other people to come and fix you, You'll always stay broken. They ain't coming back. They're at Starbucks drinking a caramel macchiato with somebody else. They ain't thinking about you. You didn't grab your head and say, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm an ambassador. I'm chosen. I'm accepted. I'm loved. I'm redeemed. I'm glorified. I'm healed, I'm ordained, I'm full of destiny, I'm full of greatness, I'm full of purpose. I don't need my preacher telling me that. Oh, I don't need anybody telling me that. Stand to your feet around God's house. I remember being on a prison bus. I don't know if you've ever been there before. It's hard to get lower than that. Handcuffed in front of me. A belly chain around me with a lock, a padlock right there. Shackles on my feet. In an orange jumpsuit. They would transfer you from institution to institution, be a couple of hour rides and four and a half years here and five and a half, you know, just all these different places being locked up. And, the, and that one place I had been in was five and a half years. I did eight and a half altogether, but I remember being on that bus after five and a half years, not having to see the world, 
And I haven't seen any McDonald's sign or anything. Five and a half years. And I remember being on that bus, riding on that bus. And my head was on that little mesh cage on that bus glass window. And all the other guys, they were talking junk to each other, doing whatever they were doing, but I wasn't focusing on none of that. I was looking out the window. And I began to say, I'm better than this. God, you've got something for me. And with tears coming down both sides of my face, I began to prophesy even over my own self. Some of you are waiting on other people to come and lay hands on you and fix stuff. You ain't got to wait on the next sermon for your life to turn around. You ain't got to wait on the next word. This is your word. This is your word. This altar calls for discouraged people. I don't know who you are, but will you come? Will you come? Discouraging your job, discouraging your finances, discouraging your ministry, discouraging your walk, discouraged. Will you come? One of the greatest tools of the enemy is the tool of discouragement. I should be further along than what I am. Sometimes you look around and the people that you were there for, they're not there for you. Did you hear what I said? Sometimes in life, you look around and the people that you were that you are there for, the people that you would fly across the world to see, won't even walk across the road to see you. And you have to say this. I will learn to encourage myself in the Lord. I'm smiling today because, because before anybody can call me and tell me, Pastor, we're praying for you, we're praying for the church. I got into a place with God. And God said, you my boy. I got you. Come on, that's a good place to praise. But if there's anybody else, just, just anybody else discouraged, maybe discouraged in your marriage, maybe discouraged in your finances, maybe discouraged about a situation. You've been in a situation, for, you were in Ziglag. I told you that crowns, that the kings are not made in, in, in Jerusalem. Kings are made as Ziglag. God makes kings. You know what he makes kings? God makes kings in pits. God makes kings in graves. God makes kings in virgin wombs. God, God makes kings in the most obscure places. God uses nails. He doesn't go to crowns. He uses nails. He uses crosses. Has anybody read that in the Bible? I'm going to let y'all worship. Go ahead, turn it up just a little bit, man of God. And I'm going to open up the altar. Is there anybody else? Maybe you've been in a season of discouragement. I believe this word is for you. God said, I want you to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Come on, will you come? I know there's more out there. Will you come? Don't let the devil talk you out of it. You're discouraged about your kids. You raised them up right. You prayed with them. You laid hands on them. You thought they were going to be in church. You thought they were going to be serving God, but they're in the world right now, and, and you're discouraged. You're discouraged. You thought that the lump would be gone by now. You thought that your body would be healed by now. And you're discouraged. You thought that you would be past that addiction by now. But you're still struggling. Will you come? If you've never received Christ as your Savior. If you've never surrendered to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God says, I want you to come. I want you to come. Give me your heart. Give me your life. Give me your soul. Will you come? Anybody discouraged? I've been discouraged. I've been discouraged in my marriage. I give so much, but they give so little. I feel like I'm in this house all by myself. God said, I want you to encourage yourself in me. God said, I want you to encourage yourself in me. Well, Pastor, I've been working at this job for so long. 
They've never given me a raise. They've never given me a raise. They've hired people after me and they've promoted them, but they haven't sought me yet. God says, I want you to learn to encourage yourself in me. Ziglag, it's not the place to die, but it's the place of destiny. It's the place of destiny. What you do at Ziglag determines the rest of your life. Did you hear what I said? What you do at Ziglag will be the gauge and the measure of what happens with the rest of your life. There's so many people that have been in Ziglag. And what they've done is, after Ziglag has happened, they went home, they pulled down the drapes, they've shut the world out, they've isolated themselves, and they're in mourning on the inside. They don't experience joy, they don't experience peace. And God says, I want you to encourage yourself in me. Did you hear what I said? I don't want to just be a preacher. I want to be a minister of God's word. Did you hear what I said? I thought I was saying, encourage yourself in me. And what he wants you to know is that he's the same God. Has, has God pulled anybody out of here, out of anything in the past? If that's you, could you raise your hand? If God pulled you out of anything in the past, well, keep that hand up, look at me. If he did it then, and if he did it before, he'll do it again. Did you hear what I said? If he pulled you out of the hand of the mouth, if he pulled you out of the mouth of the lion and out of the mouth of the bear, and out of the hand of the lion and out of the hand of the bear, he'll pull you out of zigzag as well. But he leaves that up to you. After the He leaves that up to you. You alone, Jesus, are my heart's desire and I long I wasn't ready for that, but I like it. to burn, worship you. Can we just go with this? Oh, oh you we just go with this? alone right. are my strength. Now, Come my shield together, and we'll worship and I'll let you go after that to you like alone you so, so may good. my spirit look so good. not too loud just leave it right like that thank you for you. Your